sing that last phrase. My life I give henceforth to live 
O Christ, for thee alone. Think about the things that you say and the things that you sing. God will hold you accountable for them. Do you really mean by the grace of God to live every moment of the rest of your life for the Lord Jesus Christ? Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Very important passage of scripture to remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. We will give account for those things which we have said and which we have sung, verbalized through music in the day of judgment. Let's take our Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Very important study that we are doing at this time as we look through the qualifications of deacons and the qualifications of elders as set forth in the word of God. This is not merely Paul's personal opinion of what he would like to see. This is divinely inspired inspiration, words of God himself penned by the Apostle Paul. And he's writing to young Timothy, a young man who is involved in evangelistic and pastoral ministries, so that he might know what kind of men should be placed as leaders in each of the churches where he has led people to Christ and discipled them in their faith. Very important qualifications are given to us in these passages. <clears throat> Tonight we're looking again at the parallel passages of 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. And then moving over to Titus chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, <clears throat> having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. Very important qualifications listed for us here and a couple of other minor passages where things are mentioned. But these are the two primary passages dealing with the 22 qualifications required for a man to be appointed as an elder. Now we had an, uh, an overview of the office of elder, what the office of elder is, the office of the bishop the uh, bishopric, as it's translated over in the book of Acts. Uh, and last week we began an overview of the qualifications, not merely the office itself, but the qualifications for men appointed to that office. We saw that it is proper and appropriate to aspire to the office of an elder or a bishop, and that obviously assumes the proper motivation that we discussed. Observation number two was the office of an elder is a lot of work. Paul uses the word ergon here 
which is the word for heavy labor, toil, or an occupation. <clears throat> and we saw that the work that an elder is to be doing is to repair those who have other spiritual gifts so that they might do the work of the ministry, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Too often uh, it is thought that the pastor has the job as the pastor of doing all the work of the ministry. That's not what's taught by the New Testament. My job is to repair you, to help you use the gifts that you have so that you might be able to do the work of the ministry, of serving other believers, in love serving one another, and ministering one to another with whatever gift it is, or gifts plural, that God has given to you. We've already seen that the term elder in the way that a man in the office is to function is to be with spiritual maturity gained from having years in the faith. And that's where we get our Greek word, uh, our English word Presbyterian is from that Greek word presbyteros, an elder. And where the term bishop comes from, episkopos, is where that word episcopal comes from. Both of those are used of the men functioning as elders. They're also called overseers in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Their job is to feed the flock of God, that is to shepherd the flock of God. It's poimino, the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. The job of the elders is to do that work. The pastor is an elder. Even the apostles were elders in the church. Peter speaks of himself as an elder. We find that there are multiple elders in each church in the New Testament. Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. We saw the term bishop uh, has as its chief example the Lord Jesus Christ, even as the term elder and pastor and deacon also point back to what Christ has set the example for us to do. The term elder dealt with a man who has extensive spiritual experience, understanding and maturity. The term bishop is used of that same man, indicating the nature of the work that he has undertaken, which is to watch over the flock of God. We find that the bishopric or the office of a bishop, the office of an elder, can be lost through sin. We got an illustration of that with Judas falling from the office of a bishop in Acts chapter 1 verse 20 because of sin. However, the spiritual gift of pastor teacher cannot be lost. An office can be lost, a gift cannot be lost. Romans 11:29 for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. We find that Paul speaks of our gifts in the same context as he speaks of our election in Romans chapter 11. And our election is permanent. It cannot be lost. Tonight we want to look at the qualifications that are given to us here in this passage that we've just read in 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 2 through 7. The first word, a bishop must be, it's imperative. This is not an option must controls the entire passage. It is a requirement that all of these qualifications be met. First, he must be blameless. And epileptos, that which cannot be laid hold of, that which is not open to censure, one who is irreproachable in his conduct. In other words, he's a man who has no guilt handles. That word cannot be laid hold of, which is translated blameless, means there's nothing, there's no handle where somebody can grab hold of him and twist him around and manipulate him and cause him to, to say those things that will tickle people's ears and that they want to hear. And epileptos, that which cannot be laid hold of, no guilt handles, nothing to grab on to hold him back in his ministry. The second, he must be the husband of one wife. It's a very long discussion, and one of these days we'll go in and talk at extensive detail. We're going to be talking more about elders as we get into the book of Acts. But this is a very important qualification. In fact, I've already written 16 pages on that one qualification, so we can't cover that here tonight. But we will be covering that as we get a little farther uh, into the book of Acts. Discussing all of the different suggestions that have been made by people trying to get around that qualification. And there are lots and lots of clever, clever ways of trying to get around that particular qualification. But Paul says he must be the husband of one wife. Most of the suggestions that have been offered by people attempting to get around it suggest <coughs> marriage solutions that look at marriage from the human perspective 
rather than the divine perspective. First time I ran across this one that I'm going to just give you as an illustration tonight was years and years ago, must have been back around 1976, somewhere between 76 and 77. I was pastoring up in North Jersey. There was another very, very, very large neo-evangelical church, uh, probably 20 miles from where we were located. And um, the pastor there had a little bit of a problem because he had perhaps 20 to 25 elders on his board, some of whom were divorced and remarried. And so the way he interpreted this particular qualification was, he said, this means a one-woman man. A one-woman man. Which thus prevents or, or, or allows for divorce and remarriage. Because the guy only has one wife at a time. And I had opportunity to discuss a little bit with him. And I said, so you mean that a man who has been married and then he divorces his wife, then he remarries somebody else because he's currently a one-woman man. He's not running around with other women. That's okay. He said, yes. I said, well, what about if he divorces that one and marries the next one? And... Uh, but he's faithful to her as long as he's married to her. Sort of like Elizabeth Taylor who uh, said, well, you know, I've always been faithful to every one of my husbands. She was married seven times. Um, is that what God means? Then I asked him, well, then, if that's the case, how long an interval must be between marriages? Uh, suppose he's married to one for a year and he divorces her, and then he remarries the second one, and after a year divorces her... Well, yeah, I guess that would be okay. Well, how about if he marries one and a week later he divorces her and then marries the next one and a week later divorces her? What if he's like in the some cultures where all the husband has to do is say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. He says it three times. They're divorced and he can go out and marry the next one. You know, because Christian churches are planted in some of those cultures. Suppose he change his wives on a daily basis. But as long as he's married to that one, he's faithful to her. Is that what this means? Well, you see, that's ridiculous. It's not, it doesn't simply mean one woman at a time. That would make the requirement meaningless except to prevent polygamists from being elders. And there are cultures, of course, where there is polygamy still today. Uh, it still goes on even out in Utah and uh, Idaho and places like that with the uh, the really strict Mormons, those that uh, still believe in plural marriages. Is that the only people that are being prevented from being elders in the church? It's my conviction that the requirement deals with marriage from the divine perspective. What is marriage from God's viewpoint? What forms the marriage bond? What breaks the marriage bond. That's an extended discussion, uh, especially centering on Romans chapter 7. Are qualified men who become widowers disqualified at the point that their wife dies? That's a serious issue because there's good evidence that the Apostle Paul had been married because he was able to cast a vote in the Sanhedrin and he later claims the right to remarry but he also claims to be an elder. We'll discuss more about that as we get farther into the book of Acts. But in any case, it precludes those who have never been married from the divine viewpoint. It precludes those who have been divorced and the former wife is still alive. The marriage requirement is because, and this is why I believe God placed it in the list of elder qualifications, the marriage requirement is because the marital relationship of the elder and his wife ref reflect the doctrinal truth of Christ and his bride the church. That is a faithful relationship. Very important for us to remember that we model before the world the relationship of Christ and his bride, the church. The third requirement that is given here is the word vigilant. Now, we have already seen that word, but we've seen it as translated sober, and we've also seen it translated as watchful. It's the word nephalios. It's the word that we saw as we looked at the qualifications for deacons means to be free from the influence of any intoxicant, liquor, or drugs. It's the word that's translated watchfulness and has the impact of the full use of the senses for the purpose of being ready for the Lord's return. 
for the purpose of protecting others at the first sign of danger. An elder must be vigilant in spiritual things particularly so that he can protect the flock from times of danger. Sometimes it's translated watch, sometimes it's translated sober as we saw in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. That's Nephalios there. But let us who are of the day be sober, Nephalios, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 5 it's translated watch. But watch thou in all, of, all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. You know 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary is the devil, uh, uh, the adversary of the devil is the roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Nephalios. The next requirement that's given here in 1 Timothy 3 is sober. And here a different word for sober is used. Although we've seen Nephalios translated as sober, we have an English word sober also that is translating a different Greek word here at this point, sophron. It means to be of a sound mind, or what we might call sober-minded. The man who is an elder must be sober-minded, not giddy, not flighty, not an airhead. He must be sober-minded. One who is self-controlled and not likely to yield to panic. One who will not yield to hasty decisions. One who by his actions and doctrine cultivates sound judgment and prudence. How little we hear of prudence today. How little we hear of sound judgment. You know, in the, the legal realm, there's what's called good business judgment. And many times, a, a board of directors for a for-profit corporation can be held accountable for what they have done by the shareholders if they have not exercised sound business judgment. But if the shareholders sue them at a court of law and the board of directors demonstrates to the judge that that board has exercised careful business decision because they have considered such and such, it's written in their notes, in their minutes of their meetings, they've considered this, they've considered this, they've considered this, they've also considered the option that the shareholders are angry about and they came to the conclusion that the very best course to follow was this. Now, sometimes it's not always the best course to follow, but they have exercised sound business judgment. Elders have the same kind of a qualification as they are watching over the care of the flock of Christ. They're not sinless. They're not perfect in every decision they make. But they must be sober-minded. They must exercise sound judgment in the things of the Lord as they try to lead the flock of God. The next requirement is the word good behavior. It's a single word in Greek, two words in English, kosmios, and it has two component parts. Number one, that which is orderly. The word translated world in scripture is cosmos. This word is kosmios. Cosmos means the orderly arrangement of God's creation. And we find the word world used in a number of different ways, but its root meaning is that which is orderly. The second implication of cosmios is modest. Modest. The man who is placed in a position as an elder must be both orderly and modest. That's the same word that, for example, is used in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9, where it describes that the, the way in which women are to be adorned in church. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 2.9, In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. That's our word cosmos there. With shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. What makes a woman beautiful in the sight of God, Peter tells us, is the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is, in the sight of God, of great price. Ladies, that's not my idea. That's what the scripture says. The, that which makes a woman beautiful is not how many 
fashionable clothes she can purchase and wear them once and then wear something different the next time. It's not how loud her makeup is. It's not what kind of dangling thing she can have off her head and her face and her ears and her ankles and her wrists and wherever else. It's the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. The godly woman is going to be a modest woman. Paul says it very clearly here. That is the same word that is used for the way in which an elder is to act, good behavior. He is orderly, he is modest. The sixth qualification given in this list is that he must be given to hospitality. That is, he earnestly desires, or actually can be translated, is addicted to hospitality. He's somebody who loves to exercise hospitality. That, of course, obviously implies a man who has a wife. Normally it's the wife who will fix the meals and so on. Addicted to hospitality. You know, a man is best seen in his home setting. He must be one who models hospitality and opens his home to others. He is someone who clearly has the spiritual gift of hospitality. Listen to other places where this is mentioned. Romans 12:13, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Titus chapter 1, verse 8, again speaking of elders, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. We'll be getting to that a little bit later on as we get into the passage in Titus. 1 Peter 4 9, use hospitality one to another without grudging. It's not like, oh man, I sure wish we didn't have to have company today. Someone who loves to open their home and have others in. You know, over the years, it's been a really a wonderful blessing. Judy and I on many occasions have had opportunity, especially to, ha to house traveling missionaries and traveling pastors and others. Every time we have presbytery here, we always have two or three guys over at the manse. This coming week, we'll be housing the, uh, the speaker for the Creation Conference. He'll be with us Saturday night and Sunday night. A wonderful privilege because it enriches us as well as hopefully enriching others. It gives us opportunity for personal interaction with others who have a need of hospitality. It tells us that an elder must have this earnest driving desire and exercise the gift of hospitality. The next requirement is apt to teach. Didaktikos. Not didaskalos, but didaktikos. We get our English word didactic from that Greek word. And the old English word apt means skilled at. And that is what is implied by the Greek here. A man who is skilled at teaching. That clearly connects this to the gift of teacher and to the gift of pastor teacher. The man must be demonstrating that gift before being placed as an elder. We find it used over in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and following. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid. Paul writing to young Timothy here, telling him how to handle problems in the church, knowing that they do gender strife. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach. Skilled at teaching, you deal with those problems in a gentle manner, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. This is the way in which an elder must teach. He has to be skilled at teaching, gentle in doing it, patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. They don't always repent. They don't always acknowledge the truth. Sometimes because their ideas are so deeply ingrained in them, they refuse. They stiffen their necks. Only God can deal with that situation. That comes from the Greek word, or from the root, didasko, to teach. Some have tried to claim that there are ruling elders and teaching elders, and that ruling elders don't have to be teaching elders too, on the basis of 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 
17. I'll read you both verse 17 and verse 18 to get the context. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. And so they will point to those verses and they say, you see, it says that the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. So you've got the ruling ones and then you've got uh, especially those who also do some of the teaching, labor in the word and doctrine. So you've got to have two classes of elders, those who rule well and those who labor in the word and doctrine. That's not what it says in English and that's not what it says in Greek either. But it's clear in both English and in Greek. It's wrong for three reasons to assume that there are different classes of elders based on those two verses there for at least three reasons. Number one, it pits scripture against scripture in the context of the same book because the Apostle Paul has said in chapter 3 that the elders must be apt to teach, skilled at teaching. And he describes how that is to be done in chapter 2 as he speaks to young Timothy. The second reason that it's wrong is... Paul has stated in 1 Timothy 3, our text, that it's a requirement for an elder to be a skilled teacher. And thirdly, to claim that the word, especially in verse 17, indicates two different classes of elders is a misunderstanding of a very important little Greek word. It's the word malista. That's the word that's translated especially here in that verse, in verse 17. It's not merely a superlative, but it's used to clarify what is meant by the speaker. It's a word that's used to say, now I'm about to restate what I've just said so that it'll give you some clarification on what it was I just said. You know how a preacher will say, you know, I went to town the other day. That is, I went to Collingswood. Now, if he simply said went to town, there might be some question as to which town he went to. Well, he says, but by that I mean to say, I went to Collingswood, you know that town and Collingswood are referring to the same thing. That's what the word malista does. By that I mean to say, in modern English is what we would say, thus rule well is equated with the phrase labor in the word and doctrine. Ruling well means that they are doing a good job of preaching the word and laboring in doctrine. It tells us that double honor belongs to those who labor in the word and doctrine. And we'll be talking about this later on as we get further into the book of Acts, but that word means a double pay. It's a word that's used for remuneration for work. Double pay. Those who labor in the word and doctrine ought to receive double pay. Nobody in the church wants to hear that today. They say, you're sounding like Father Divine. You're sounding like one of these charismatic preachers that gets thrown in jail for tax evasion. <laughs> no, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. They're worthy of it. They don't always get it. In fact, they rarely get it. But those who labor in the, work and do in the word and doctrine are worthy of double honor, a special word for double pay. So we see that there's no distinction between ruling elders and another class of teaching elders. They all must be exercising the gift of ruling. They all must be exercising the gift of teaching. The word ruling, as you, those of you who were with us when we went through the spiritual gifts, you know that that word does not mean just running things. For histemi means to stand before someone else as an example. To stand before them for the purpose of aid. Not merely standing before them in the position of one who is in authority. The next phrase is not given to wine. So anybody who missed it back there under vigilant, whether or not to be uh, under nephalios, under the control of an intoxicating substance, they will certainly get it when you get to this point. One word, par oinais, literally alongside of the wine. Book of Proverbs calls it tarrying at the wine. Sometimes it's used of the secondary effects as well as drunkenness, that is, staggering around drunk, getting into drunken fights, infidelity as a result of alcohol. We find it used in many different contexts. No striker, plectes. That's somebody who's not quick on the trigger to punch somebody out if he gets mad at them. There are people with very short fuses. 
They should never be placed in the office of elder. Very quick tempers. Years ago, I was serving in a church where they had a man who, if he sensed that you were going to say something that he disagreed with, would immediately explode and yell and scream, and he might not have even had the right guess as to what you were about to say. You certainly don't want to put somebody like that into a position of leadership. Oftentimes that kind of person will get their own way. Oftentimes that, times that kind of person can bull their way through a situation where they get done what they want to get done. And there are many people in business that are like that. That is not good for church leadership. No striker. The next qualification, not greedy, a filthy lucre. Eiskarkerdes is the word, a big long word. It's also used in chapter 3, verse 8, and we've already seen that of the qualifications for deacons. It's also used in Titus chapter 1 of apostate leaders who do have a greed for filthy lucre. It's a combination of two Greek words. It's a combination of the word gain, which is kerdos, which is used to both good and evil. Uh, many illustrations we could give you out of, for example, Philippians. And eistros, which means base or shameful. And there are many different uses of the term base or shameful in the New Testament. It's used, for example, of women speaking out in church. That's base or shameful. But when it's connected to gain, it's that one who is greedy of shameful, shamefully earned or gained money. They've cheated somebody out of it. They've stolen it from the till at work. Uh, they have pulled a little shenanigan and cheated the government out of income taxes. That's shameful gain. Greedy of filthy lucre. It's used of women uh, with shorn hair. Translated shame in 1 Corinthians 14.35. It's translated shame in Ephesians 5.12 where it mentions the base and bestial practices of those who lead lascivious lives. Not greedy of filthy lucre. It keeps interesting company in the eyes of God. Instead, he must be patient, epiakes, literally gentle, seemly, fitting, equitable, fair, moderate, forbearing. You know, there's a difference between patience and long-suffering. Patience deals with the issue of putting up with difficult circumstances. Long-suffering deals with the issue of putting up with difficult people. Epiakes. Not a brawler, a macos. You've heard of guys who are macho? <laughs> Actually, it comes through Spanish, goes back really to Greek. Not one who's macho. Not one who is a fighter. One who's not contentious. One who doesn't look for opportunities to get into a brawl. It's different from number eight, and number nine, excuse me, uh, which says no striker. Because that's the man who has the quick temper. This is a man who looks for opportunities to be disagreeable and to get into fights with people. The other simply has a quick temper. But an elder must not be the kind of man who looks for opportunities to get into a fight. Because that implies a fight produced by a weak lack of control in a man who gives in to drink back there to not give in to wine, or a man who has a quick temper, back to number eight, or a man who systematically goes out of his way to cause trouble and fight because it makes him feel good to win. We would call him a bully. You never put a man into the office of elder who is a bully, who pushes weaker people around just for the fun of it. Have you ever known anybody in your life like that? Well, I think back to high school days. I think back to college days. There were guys like that. There were girls like that, too. Girls who enjoy pushing other girls around because they can get away with it. Because they have the dominant kind of type A personality that can run over another girl. Sometimes they travel in packs. And they bully other girls. Certainly, a man who has these character qualities should never be placed into the position of an elder. 
Now he goes back to the issue of money again. We already talked about not greedy of filthy lucre, ice crocardes. But now he says, not covetous, a philar agoros, not a lover of money. Not merely not a lover of wrongfully gained money, but one who is not a lover of money. That's what the word literally means. The a ah is the negative. Then we have the word philos, which is lover, and then agoros, which is the word for money. Not a lover of money, not covetous. You know, it sounds different when you say not a lover of money, doesn't it? Because <laughs> most of us sort of love money, don't we? He's a man without love of money. That is not one of his priorities. That's not what he places first in life. We find it also used in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 3. The best way to demonstrate not being a love of, lover of money is through the use of the gift of giving. You know, covetousness, the same word that's used here in the negative, is one of the character qualities of the apostates in the last days. They are going to be lovers of money. They teach false doctrine so that they can manipulate money out of people. It also tells us in Titus, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5, and Colossians 3, verse 5, both those verses, Colossians 3, it's chapter 3 in Colossians, chapter 5 in Ephesians, both times, verse 5, that the love of money, that those who love money are idolaters, that the love of money is idolatry. You've put a new God on the throne. <coughs> the covetous man is an idolater. Now we get back to the issue of marriage here in a moment, because the next qualification says, one that ruleth well his own house. And here we also tie into the gift of ruling. Same word that's being used, it means to stand as an example, to stand for aid, as well as to stand in authority. One that ruleth well his own house. It connects the gift of ruling to the family, just like it connects the gift of ruling to serving as an elder. Then it tells us that he is not to be a novice. And there's much more that we can say on that in a moment. Not a novice. Neophutos means newly planted. One who's just been put into the ground from neos, new, and fuo, to bring forth or to produce. It denotes a new convert, a neophyte, one who because of his inexperience is unfitted to act as a bishop or overseer in the church. The man must not only have enough doctrinal content to be skilled in teaching, but he must not have a lack of spiritual experience and maturity, because if he does, he will fall prey to subtle temptation. He'll fall prey to pride. He'll fall prey to the snare of the devil. He'll fall prey to being arrogant because he's in a position of authority. And he falls into the condemnation of the devil, who also, for his pride, fell from the position in which God had placed him. And great was his fall, Isaiah chapter 14, Ezekiel chapter 28. He must have a good report of them which are without. A good witness about them born. Martyria. Where did we get our word martyr from? He's a man who is so faithful, so well known for his testimony in the outside world, a good report of them which are without. Not just how he appears on Sunday, but how he is all the rest of the week when he is dealing with the world around him. Martyria, a good witness about them born by exothen, by them that are without, those who are on the outside, by the unregenerate world. Examine a man's testimony before his unsaved friends. Find out whether or not he ever witnesses to them. They may criticize him, they may dislike him because he has a good testimony. Because he is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. 
People can be hated because they have obnoxious personalities. That's not what we're talking about here. It's not an issue of personality. It's an issue of testimony, of the good report of them that are without. What do they say about this one who would be placed in the office of an elder? Is he upright in all of his dealings in society? Is he so clean and pure that no reproach is brought upon the name of Christ because he's a leader in the church? That particular disqualification is called on a dismiss, reproach, defamation, or disgrace. You don't want a man who is that way. We find that one who is to be placed in the office of an elder must be living his faith and not subject to the allurements or the entrapments that are all around us in the world. You can't even walk through a grocery store line without seeing the wretched magazines that even at Walmart they stick in the line going out about who's had an affair with whom and you know who's going through a juicy divorce at this point and scantily clad pictures of celebrities on the covers. A man who's not born a good testimony before the world is not qualified to be an elder. Two areas, the area of lust of the flesh, the area of lust for money, because that always brings disgrace on the body of Christ. And this man, if he is not well grounded in the faith, will fall and bring reproach to the name of Christ. That brings us quickly through 1 Timothy. The things that are required of an elder here. Very important for us to remember because as our elders get older and as they go to be with the Lord, we need to have some deacons from which to choose a pool of elders. That's why I said weeks ago that we need to begin to pray that God will raise up men to fill the office of deacon here at this church. We have no deacons. Our last deacon went home to be with the Lord a year ago. And folks, there's nobody in the wings. As we look at our elders, and some of whom are getting much older now. For the church to live, we must have leaders who are qualified according to the principles of the Word of God. This is a very serious issue. I hope you are giving it much thought and prayer every day, praying that God will bring to this church and raise up from among our young people men who are qualified to be church leaders, qualified according to the word of God. Not according to the word of man, but according to the word of God. The Lord willing, we'll pick it up there next week with Titus chapter 1, looking at verses 6 through 9. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the great and precious promises of your word. And our Lord Jesus Christ himself declared, I will build my church. This is not our church. And church he was speaking of was not the buildings. He was speaking of the people. And for the church to function properly, it must have leaders who are qualified according to your word. So, Father, we earnestly beseech you as a congregation that you will raise up men in this church who are qualified to be deacons, that you will raise up men in this church who are qualified to be elders, that you will give spiritual stamina and leadership to these men as we face an increasingly darkened world. Men who will have a good testimony to those who are without, so that no reproach will be brought to the name of Jesus Christ through a fall or through sin. 
Father, we commit this, your word, to you. We pray that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.